constant challenging of something, if we're all using the same rules, should be actually desired. Nonviolent resistance movements were three times as effective as uh, violent ones. I am very concerned that things would become violent. Every movement needs to have an agenda with an ABC plan. So the choice is either to sit down and do nothing or to hope that peaceful agitation wins the day, which it never has. I mean, the struggle of people for their freedom has always involved violence. Are there occasions when the use of violence can and should be justified in seeking political ends? I think so. And I think history teaches us that. I mean, there are, of course, different forms of violence. I'm not and never have been a supporter of terrorism, uh, defined as it should be defined, either individual or that used by states. But I am a strong supporter of, historically speaking, of all the revolutions that have taken place, the slave rebellions that have taken place in history, starting, if you like, with the American Revolution against British colonialism, carrying on to the French Revolution, the Revolution of the Enlightenment, the link between the intellectuals prior to the revolution and the revolutionaries was very strong. The English Revolution, which laid the foundations of democracy, which is why Cromwell's statue is still outside the House of Commons so far. No one has argued that it should be removed, though they don't allow stamps with Cromwell's head on it because it requires the monarch's head on it too. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, of course, in the 20th century, We've had a whole wave of uh, revolutions and revolutionary struggles which have deployed violence, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese, Vietnamese, Cuban, the huge anti-colonial struggles waged by the Vietnamese. So I'm afraid it's very difficult studying modern or medieval history uh, or uh, early modern history to get away from this uh, idea of violence. And I think we have to determine Attach the violence used by masses in motion uh, from acts of individual terror carried out for whatever reason, or suicide terrorism, or, or whatever. I mean, the struggle of people for their freedom has always involved violence because the people they're trying to gain independence from deploy it as well. So the choice is either to sit down and do nothing or to hope that peaceful agitation wins the day, which it never has, with very few exceptions, and to throw the path open to those who occupy, oppress, and uh, kill people ad nauseam. I mean, this goes on today, even as we're sitting here. Six wars are being waged in the, United, uh, in the world by the United States, the most brutal of which, which is hardly mentioned, is the war in the Yemen being waged by Saudi Arabia and its allies, backed by the United States and Britain. Too often, protest movements say what they're against, but not what they're for. I don't think it's a choice of either or. I think both political parties and social activism have a role. And indeed, if you look throughout history, you will find that nearly all the great social reform movements began outside of parliament, outside of formal political parties. They began as grassroots movements and eventually got translated and adopted by political parties. So if you want to bring about change, the mechanism in our society is through a parliamentary legislative process. Ultimately, all social movements need to elect members of parliament who will make those changes happen. I would say that one of the big problems with a lot of activism has been its often negative, oppositionist nature. Uh, too often, protest movements say what they're against, but not what they're for. And that, to me, undermines their credibility and success. Because to persuade the public, you not only have to critique what is, you have to have an agenda for what could be. And I think that's one of the great failings, sadly, of the Occupy movement, which I was very supportive of. It didn't really have a plan about how the ideas that it espoused 
could be translated in practical legislative reforms. Um, at the end of the day, every movement needs to have an agenda with an ABC plan. Now, I'll just give you one example. Uh, as you will recall, up until the mid-1990s, the LGBTI community was a victim of grave harassment by the police throughout the country, with thousands of gay men being arrested every year for consenting adult same-sex behavior, which was not a crime between heterosexual men and women. We went to initially do negotiations with the police at New Scotland Yard and other police services around the country. They were polite, they smiled, they shook our hands, they gave us tea and sandwiches, but then went away and continued their pattern of arrests and harassment. So the group that I was involved in, Outrage, decided to leave. We thought this was just a police PR exercise. They were inviting us to pretend and project that they were actually engaging with the LGBTI community, when in reality, nothing had changed. So we began a very high-profile campaign of direct action against the police. We occupied police stations. We interrupted the press conferences of the then Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Paul Condon. We exposed undercover police entrapment opera operations, uh, secretly photographing undercover police officers who were going into parks and public toilets, waving their willies, and then arresting any man who responded. At the end of the day, that direct action campaign is what forced the police to rethink. They were so embarrassed because we got acres and acres of newsprint and uh, hours and hours of TV and radio, radio coverage. Our argument was the police were pursuing a campaign of persecution against people who engaged in victimless behavior. This was an irresponsible waste of police resources at a time when officers were claiming they didn't have enough staff or resources to tackle domestic violence, rape, racist attacks, queer bashing violence. So we won the PR battle through our direct action campaign, which got in the headlines. The police invited us back to New Scotland Yard, thinking they could then buy us off again. But we came back with a concrete program of 12 policies for a non-homophobic policing policy. Practical ideas, partly drawn from the progressive policies of police services in Copenhagen and Amsterdam, but partly ones we'd invented ourselves. It completely threw the police. They just saw us as a protest group. But when we came back with practical ideas, they were put on the spot. And at the end of the day, they couldn't argue against the policies we proposed. The fly in the ointment they threw at us was one of our proposals was to argue for a lesbian and gay liaison officer. So they appointed a right-wing evangelical Christian, <laughs> Inspector John Brown, as the liaison officer. But we decided, rather than rubbish him, we decided to try and persuade him. So we took him to meet victims of police harassment who told their personal stories. And over a period of about three months, he became convinced the police were acting inappropriately and not fulfilling their duty. He actually became our greatest champion in the Metropolitan Police Service. So there's an example of how protest backed up with practical, credible, plausible ideas can actually bring about change. So challenge is actually an important, in fact, the most important part of the process. Now, the difference, perhaps, for me between engineering and, you know, if we're talking about political um, realms, is that in engineering, no matter what position you're in, in this hierarchy, you all work on the same rules. You're all using the laws of physics. And nobody, no matter how high they are in a particular company, no matter where they are in society, they can't use different rules. They are not going to be able to operate on different rules of physics. So therefore, the, the playing field is one that is transparent, is one that I understand, no matter where I come in in the hierarchy, and I can understand that the status that somebody has earned as a very good engineer is one that is credible and legitimate. So I trust in that if this person is in an, in an elite position, if they're at the top of the hierarchy, they've earned it in the kind of the social contract that we have in the engineering world.
What I would argue is that when we talk about elite in this realm, in the political realm, the difference is that we don't all play on the same rules. And so the question that I was asked in this topic is, should we challenge those who are elites, and should we possibly eradicate them? As an engineer, I believe we should always be challenging those who are in any position. That is how you stress test whether something is actually any good. The constant challenging of something, if we're all using the same rules, should be actually desired. Because in the engineering world, to get to the best solution, you iterate. In the science world, you perform tests over and over and over again in order to get to the best result. So challenge is actually an important, in fact, the most important part of the process. So why should that same process not apply to society? If we think about elites, then not only thinking about status, but also about power, and I think the conversation about power is really important. Power tends to be something that people want to accrue and accumulate more of. No, people rarely sort of sit back and say, well, I have <laughs> enough power now. I'm done. I'm going to go to sleep. No. For some reason, something inherently about power asks us to continue wanting more. But I don't think it necessarily is going to not exist. I think, for me, power is like fire, is like energy. It is something that is neither created nor destroyed, only the form changes. You can never create or destroy energy. It only is transformed into different... You go from light to heat to so on. And so the question for me is, how are we distributing that power? Who gets to choose how, how that power is being distributed? And perhaps it's not about whether um, an elite should exist or not, but how we make sure that we're all playing by the same rules. Because right now, we're not. And I think part of the reason there is this distrust is because I know that the rules that the elite in the political world are playing by are completely different rules to me. Comple they've, set them, they've set it up for themselves. They're not interested in, in changing them, and there is very little that I can do as someone who plays in a different ballgame completely. They're playing chess, and I'm here playing handball. Right? Completely different set of rules, and yet we're supposed to exist in the same space and use the same resources and so on. So for me, it is a question of first principles in that, how do we make sure that the rules that we're all playing on are the same? And then, how do we make sure that the power's, power is distributed? So that you might, in the engineering world, power is distributed, but I know that I'm going to listen to that person because they have a better understanding of the rules than I. And I'm actually okay with that. We really need systems change. Well, yes, I am very concerned that things will become violent. Are peace and stability just necessary casualties when there's so much at stake? Uh, I'd want to start with a critique of the question itself, uh, because it's premised upon an assumption that Britain has been a historically stable society. And of course, this country had a revolution, a civil war in the mid-17th century, 150 years before the French Revolution. More recently, we have the rise of Chartism, the movements for democratic suffrage during the 19th century, the suffragettes. And of course, we had a civil war, effectively, uh, with uh, the Republic of Ireland and its session to the Free State uh, only a century ago. And then more recently, of course, you've got the miners' strike, you've got all grief, you've got what happened with Murdoch and, and the press unions in the 1980s. Immense social strife. But where Mary is absolutely right is that more or less that was managed through political institutions. A lot of people were hurt, uh, a lot of people saw their lives and their, their way of life decimated, but it didn't descend into the things we would normally think of as insurrection or civil war. It probably got closer than many of us think, but it didn't. Similarly, you have austerity since 2010. British Medical Journal says that there are 120 to 130,000 excess deaths which correlate with austerity. Now we can have an argument as to whether or not it caused it. We've got life expectancy falling. The average male from a working class background in Sheffield or in Glasgow lives 65 years. That's when the Tories now want to increase the pension to 70. So even within the present moment, there's a great deal of violence. Um, if you're on low pay, if you're sick, Life isn't necessarily that good. If you're in, in, in poverty as a pensioner, speaking of uh, excess deaths, about 30,000 people die every year. They're called excess deaths by the civil service. This is people that die of the cold because of fuel poverty, and they tend to be older. But of course, because we're not interested in disrupting the status quo, nobody calls that what it is, uh, which is effectively a form of social murder. 30,000 people is a lot. We're not talking about 10 or 20 people, and yet we do nothing about it. Why? Because it would disrupt the economic orthodoxy. Uh, and then I'll finish with this. 
The book I've written, Fully Automated Luxury Communism, it's a bit more pragmatic and practical than it sounds in its suggestions. It starts actually with a set of analyses, which probably on this panel we agree on. I think in the 21st century, we are facing several crises, which I think are existential to market capitalism. Demographic aging, very difficult to care for an aging population with a market-based system. Climate change, that has problems with regard to geopolitics, resource scarcity, has problems with regards to uh, mass migrations. You have automation and what that could do for under and unemployment. And then finally, you have uh, what I would call basically the continuation of the crisis we've seen since 2008, the financial crisis. Today in the US, 40 million people still use food stamps. It's 26 million in 2007. People here are using food banks. Home ownership in the US is now at its lowest level since the mid 1960s. Home ownership here is its lowest level since the mid 1980s. That's only going to get worse. So I think together, that panoply of crises mean that we are going to face significant challenges to our democratic system. So either as a society, we accept the reality of those problems, and we say, you know what, we really need systems change. Or well, yes, I am very concerned that things will become violent. Wars and revolutions kill people by the millions and tens of millions. Stephen, we've heard that case that peaceful engagement on its own simply hasn't been a useful way of changing society, with the exception of a very few cases. You have spoken out for better angels uh, very, uh, very publicly. Would you agree with the case that Tarek has made? Uh, no, I wouldn't agree. I guess I start from the premise that killing people is bad, and killing uh, more people is worse than killing fewer people. So even though I, I also don't support terrorism, uh, terrorists have killed a tiny number of people. The worst terrorist attack in history, 9-11, killed 3,000. Typical terrorist attack kills uh, a handful. Uh, whereas wars and revolutions kill people by the millions and tens of millions. And often uh, it is true, Tariq listed a number of violent events in human history. Uh, he did not make the argument that these are, uh, are good or justifiable. These were history's disasters. Now, I do believe that there are arguments that there can be occasions in which violence is justified if it is the only way to prevent greater violence. Again, I'm assuming that, that murdering people is bad. If you disagree with that, then you can disagree with the whole argument. And that murdering you know, 2 million people, 4 million people, 20 million people is really, really bad. Now, did the events that we just uh, heard result in uh, the reduction of uh, violence, prevention of killing of even greater numbers, which I suppose could be used as a utilitarian argument justifying violence? The answer is, in, in virtually all the cases, no. The uh, French Revolution was a disaster, killed two million people, led to the rise of Napoleon, uh, perhaps the world's first totalitarian fascist dictator who began wars of conquest that killed another, an additional four million people, led to the restoration of slavery, to the restoration of the uh, monarchy and a delay of democracy in France by uh, perhaps a century. Russian Revolution, killed uh, several million, led to the Russian Civil War, which killed another 9 million, led to the rise of Stalin, who killed 20 million. There's an old cliche, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. Well, it ignores the fact that people aren't eggs, and that generally it does not result in an omelet. Again, the Chinese Revolution, perhaps the most disastrous event in, in history, led to the, the uh, Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, which killed perhaps uh, 30 to to 40 million people uh, altogether. Time and again, a violent revolution, violent uh, war, uh, in addition to the moral harm of mass murder, and again, I mean murder, we're talking about millions or tens of millions of people, does not result in a uh, stable, peaceful state that saves the lives of even more. Quite the contrary. You know, a recent study by um, Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth actually looked over the last century at violent and nonviolent resistance movement resistance movements to put the Gandhian hypothesis to a test that it that there are ways of overcoming tyranny uh, using the all of the tactics that uh, that Gandhi worked out. Now you could, of course, be cynical about the Gandhian hypothesis by saying, well, he um, tugged at the heartstrings of of the British at an opportune moment, and he just got lucky. So they decided to count. Uh, of the, all of the resistance movements of the 20th century, uh, they divided them into violent ones and nonviolent ones, putting aside the question of which was more moral, that is, which murdered fewer people. Just ask the question of which is more effective. Now, it's not the case that violent resistance movements always succeed or that nonviolent ones fail or vice versa. 
But if you count them up, they found that nonviolent resistance movements were three times as effective as uh, violent ones. Doesn't mean the violent ones are never effective, but even in terms of sheer efficacy, the nonviolent ones uh, tend to have a higher success. Rate. When you say three times as effective, Stephen, do you mean they killed one third as few people? Or? No, they uh, three times more often they resulted in uh, regime change. Okay, that's an interesting definition and one that I think we will have to come back and, to uh, in the in the discussion. Of final observation is that in a in a survey of what leads to stable democracies, uh, inspired in part by the. Uh, 2003 invasion of Iraq, which I think we all agree was not a successful uh, uh, measure to, to uh, install a, a peaceful liberal democracy. It, in, that actually fits into a pattern that uh, decapitations of an uh, existing tyrannical regime generally don't result in a uh, stable democracy. I'll add with one final observation. Uh, I'm Canadian. So uh, we actually did achieve independence from uh, Britain nonviolently, and uh, uh, we ha took a little bit longer than the United States. Uh, but you know, the American Revolution was a pretty bloody uh, and and brutal mess as well. And uh, Canada has result it is today one of the uh, most stable, least violent, and most democratic societies on earth. You can't de-network a society. You can't unliberate a generation. It's going to take a little bit of time to win because we're not just up against the state, nor even is the state the biggest enemy of XR or of the other groups like Me Too or Black Lives Matter. Even Black Lives Matter. The problem is what, what the German philosopher Hannah Arendt called the temporary alliance of the elite and the mob. We're up against a temporary alliance of authoritarian elites who, who keep their money offshore, who are heavily invested in fossil fuels, surveillance technologies, yeah, these are what these guys, and of course, by, by investing in offshore, that is anti-taxation, they're effectively investing in anti-society. Now, that's on one hand, there are large numbers of people who need to believe that climate change is not real, who need to believe that uh, women are subordinate to men, because in their, their world will disintegrate in the next 20 years because of the changes we need to make. Your generation cannot go back into the box that my grandmother's generation of women could had to live in, or gay men, or transgender people, or black people. It is, we are, you can't de-network a society. You can't unliberate a generation, okay? So XR, for me, is the latest iteration of the new kind of protest that is the, almost the son and daughter of 2011 and the Occupy movement. The Occupy movement imagined a new society, and we assembled the forms of that society on the internet, the networks, and then we took it into physical space in the form of tent camps and square occupation. They didn't last. They were easily repressed. Extinction Rebellion, Me Too, and Black Lives Matter take it to a visceral level, to a granular level. If you think about what BLM is saying is that the wages of whiteness is that if a policeman arrives on a trouble scene, black people get shot and white people generally don't. That's why these racists spend all their time on the phone trying to call the cops on black people for selling water on the street. What they hope is the cop will arrive and shoot somebody, and it ain't going to be them. No, that's a very different thing than saying, I need civil rights. I need civil rights for Martin Luther King, for Malcolm X, etc. cetera. Stokely Carmichael, was re Angela Davis, was, re was a real thing. But to say, you no longer have the right to shoot me when the cops turn up is a, is a different, more granular thing. It demands changes of human behavior. Me too demands a change in human behavior. I work in the theater sometimes. The theater is undergoing a revolution because of the demand of female actors and, and producers no longer for their physical invasion of their body space under the excuse of the theater. Not just talking about directors saying, you know, let's, let's have a drink after work. You know, by the way, you'll get a lovely part in my next film. No, it's about the actual physicality of theater is changing. There's now a movement that helps people act through whether they have to do a sex scene or a sexual violence scene. Both these things exist in reality and should be portrayed on stage. But now we have movements where we mediate those and we allow people to explore what is happening to them in a much more reflective way, reflective way than before. So what I'm describing there is the way Me Too is not just transforming kind of the agenda of feminism, it's transforming a, a real industry. It's also transforming um, parts of corporate life, not enough. There are now tests and courses. They call them the Weinstein test in corporate life. You, can you pass the test? Otherwise, you don't become a director of this bank. Uh, so the amazing thing is that 
going back to XR that we've got here, what's XR's number one demand? Tell the truth. We're at a philosophy festival where routinely people question the possibility of truth, but I don't. And I think that's another thing. There are truths. Uh, they are provisional. They're scientifically verified. We need to fight for them. Of course, the state are going to repress it. It's going to be wake up time when some quite, you know, I, I'd say, you know, young, young and therefore inexperienced protesters, my generation of climate protesters, the people I collaborated with and reported on, have been trying to say, look, the cops will come. Soon there will be people arriving in your camps who look unstable. Uh, you need to deal with them you need to, in a good way. You know, we need to get, educate and care for people. But what the cops then do is that they, like the evil doctor, they look, they look at the thing and they go, at an entity, and this occasionally it doesn't have to be our police, it's another country's police. It can be a private security company you've never heard of. They say, what are the what are the illnesses and weaknesses of this thing? How can we make them worse? That's what happened. That's what happened to the, to the tent camp outside London Stock Exchange. That it was quite clear somebody was exacerbating all the problems. And I don't believe it's the British state. I believe you know that the whole world is now a kind of outsourced, there's a kind of state mischief making that's outsourced to private companies we've never heard of. You, you saw it around Cambridge Analytica, this parent company. But we can, we can defeat them. We are millions of people. And what is more, they have sons and daughters who don't want to live in a burning planet. So in the end, we can have an argument. We Even with the kind of shittiest uh, uh, private uh, intelligence company, do you really want to live on a burning planet with chaos? with millions of refugees unstoppably moving from the global south to the north. If you want to live in that planet, go on disrupting the climate change movement. If you don't, then it, even if it might, you know, you don't like people with green hair and nose rings, fine. Just do it yourself. Lobby your Tory MP or your Republican congressperson. Tell them to stop funding climate chaos. You know, violence isn't just physical violence. There's structures of violence. There's systems of violence. I think it's important to understand, or do, you know, when we talk about violence, because you know, obviously, violence and the definite, you know, violence isn't just physical violence. There's structures of violence. There's systems of violence. That, um, so you know, when we, if it, just because there's the absence of physical violence in a in a country, like even here, for example, it doesn't mean there aren't structures of violence. Um, in the US, you know, uh, having having abortion banned in a state that is a system and structure of violence. And, you know, in that case, it's obviously a direct physical effect on people. But, you know, austerity is a structure of violence um, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think, you know, when we talk about violence, especially in the Kurdish case, you know, it's never been violence in an offensive way. It's been self-defense. You know, the Kurdish movement and therefore the guerrilla uh, guerrillas or the guerrilla army um, or the units have never gone on of, on offensive uh, attacks or wars to invade somewhere else. It's always about it's been about defending defending its people and defending its lands. So in that sense, yes, it's 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 been a necessary and unfortunately necessary aspect of the self defense has been the use. Uh, of violence in some ways, but it's it's been necessary because you know whether it's the whether we see from the examples whether it's the mothers of peace or uh, people demonstrating on on streets um, and therefore the violent repression of the you know in that case the Turkish state against it you know dragging mothers across the floor who are peacefully demonstrating who. Um, you know, when there's demonstrations, uh, tear gassing people, when people democratically uh, run for, whether it's me as mayors or MPs, imprisoning them as, you know, so-called terrorists, even though they were democratically elected. You know, in many ways, that kind of leaves you, that kind of takes away the option of non-violence from you, even though it's still tried and it's there is still that going on. And the aim is always for peace and it always should be for peace because when there isn't peace, it's people, in, you know, in places like the Middle East, it's people like the Kurds and, and um, other oppressed peoples of the world, wherever there may be violence, who are affected the most. So the aim is for peace, but unfortunately, sometimes in achieving that, certain methods don't work. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today 
to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.